Okay, thanks everybody for coming today. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Jeff Cohen. I'm with Seller Labs. I run the sales and business development team. And we had the opportunity to meet Rachel at a conference and found her presentation to be absolutely amazing and insightful and thought that it was a great presentation to share with our Seller Labs family. Um, if you are new to GoToWebinar, you are able to ask questions in the control panel. Um, we will try to get to as many of these questions as we can, but please understand we had over 400 questions submitted to us prior to this event. So we're going to try to get to as many of these as we can. Um, and for what we cannot get to, Rachel has agreed to kind of do a blog post, which will cover some of the additional information. Um, today's webinar is going to be talking about common mistakes that brand owners make when importing products from China. And Rachel Greer, our guest speaker today, has seven plus years of experience as an Amazon product compliance employee. So we're hearing kind of firsthand from somebody who was working with at Amazon um, on product compliance. And Rachel now today works with clients helping them import their products from China. Um, I hope you find this information extremely valuable. Um, all of the slides, and, and Rachel shares a lot of details in her slides, will be made available to you and we will email you a copy of the slides. As well, we will make a copy of the video of this available. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Rachel and uh, let you take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Jeff. Okay, so a little bit about um, the firm that I started and um, we'll go into the other folks in the firm as well. Um, we're a small firm based out of the um, northwest, so near the Seattle area. Uh, I didn't feel like moving after leaving Amazon. And we help Amazon sellers of every size achieve their goals of selling on Amazon. And for the most part, we're working on uh, private label for sellers and helping them understand the difficulties and the um, compliance requirements in particular coming from other parts of the world. Our goal is to help sellers to develop their product, to source it effectively, to test it, and then to launch their product in a compliant manner that will work with Amazon policy and with the legal requirements in whatever country that you happen to launch in. So I'm Rachel and um, I started the company when I left Amazon in May of this year. And I was at Amazon for seven and a half years. My last five years were in product compliance. The first two and a half were in um, the transaction risk team, which is also the team that has seller performance. Um, I am joined by four former colleagues that I worked with at Amazon. Leo is uh, specializing in packaging and product testing, and she was a private label program manager who was responsible for ensuring that products were tested for quality, regulatory, and safety, and packaged appropriately for the Amazon marketplace. Um, Kelly is a former NA operations manager for Seller Performance, so all of the policy requirements, restricted products, how do you um, properly request uh, reviews from customers, what's the policy that can get you in trouble, she's our expert there. Emily is our customer experience and product quality expert, so what kind of issues can you get into trouble with when you aren't taking that customer feedback and turning it back to your product, figuring out what went wrong. Maybe it's not actually the customer who wants a refund. Maybe it's actually that there's a problem with the product or a problem with the packaging. Let's figure out how to do that root cause analysis and fix the problem. And then we have Rain Huang, who is our um, sourcing consultant in China, and she is based in the Shenzhen area just outside of Hong Kong. And she was formerly with Target and the Home Depot, um, as well as Amazon. So she has just an enormous depth of experience when it comes to sourcing for large brands and how to really get the best prices working with the manufacturers that we help our sellers with in China. Um, she also did a lot of work sourcing in Europe and Southeast Asia, so she's not just um, a China sourcing, for, uh, sourcing professional. 
Okay, so today's topics, and we're going to move pretty quickly once we start getting into the topics because there is a lot to cover. Um, this webinar is really to get you started with the major issues that can occur and how to solve those in the specific Amazon context. So the first topic that we're going to talk about is non-retail ready packaging that can lead to suspension. And what I mean by non-retail ready packaging is that there is a, a basic requirement for all products being sold in any given marketplace. There's basic labeling requirements. If you don't meet those basic labeling requirements, then customers get suspicious. Um, second topic, selling unsafe or improperly labeled items, and we'll get into those details. Um, we have a lot of content on intellectual property, um, both figuring out whether you're infringing on someone else's intellectual property, and then we'll talk a little bit about ways to protect yourself from someone else infringing on yours. Um, regulatory enforcement can lead to customs holdups. There's also the possibility of enforcement in the market after you've imported the item. And then lastly, how do you plan for your brand? How do you plan for your brand strategy and set what your quality standards should be so that you can achieve the sales velocity that you expect? Okay, so let's just level set about what private label can be in this context. I see a lot of usage of private label that's incorrect on the web. Um, I managed the private label team for Amazon, and from a, a retailer perspective, private label is going directly to the source and cutting out a lot of the branding and marketing effort that goes into a product and making a simpler product that does the same thing but costs less. So from a retailer perspective, that's the idea of what private label is. From the Amazon seller perspective, what I'm seeing most frequently are designers who prototype and launch their own unique product and then launch it on Amazon. Since you don't need that many to start with, it's a simple way to get started. Someone who imports white or no label goods and then puts their own sticker on the product. And someone who is essentially a sourcing agent who works with factories to modify something existing or to buy something directly from their catalog and um, list it under their own label. The most important thing that you should know is that each of these different models is, has the same level of legal liability. So you as the private labeler, as the brand owner, are legally responsible for all of the products sold under that mark, which means they can, people can sue you if something goes wrong, like if you're selling a, power, a battery power bank and it explodes and someone's injured, you're responsible for that. If um, the rest of the power banks need to be recalled, then the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission can make you do the recall and all of the costs associated with that. So it's really important to start from the assumption that you hold all legal liability for the brand when you choose to private label. So there's a pretty significant hurdle there that everyone needs to understand that they're taking on when they decide to private label. However, the reason why, because usually it's anywhere between 30 and 60% margins. So it's a great business to be in, just make sure that you have your back office lined up. Okay, so what does Amazon expect of sellers? So I'm not going to go in the whole um, detail here, but really what, it, what Amazon does is they send you a very long terms of service agreement where you agree to a broad variety of requirements that they expect of you. And the most important ones are you promise that you only list goods that are safe and compliant for sale on Amazon and that you will do everything Amazon tells you to do. Those two things are where a lot of sellers get into trouble. Listing things that are unsafe, listing things that aren't labeled properly, listing things that don't have packaging to where customers feel good, and then not, not taking care of that customer and fixing their experience afterwards. And that's really what can lead to listing suspension and eventually account suspension. But the bottom line is when you sign the terms of service to become an Amazon seller, you are basically saying Amazon gets to control my business. This is their platform, this is their playground, and they get to set the rules. Okay, so let's talk about different kinds of packaging. When we talk about high-end packaging, or even just packaging that you expect to get from a retail store, you expect it to show up in the kind of packaging that will last all the way home. For online products, you end up having a lot more wear and tear on your product and on um, the packaging itself, and customers can be pretty picky about how items arrive. The one on the left, the delivery via bubble wrap and packing tape, is probably going to deliver the product safely. That's a lot of bubble wrap, but the effort to get that product unpacked and the kind of feeling when you open a box like that and you're like, what the heck? 
that depending on your brand goal is kind of not what you want to go for. Um, the the goal when you have a customer open your product that they can immediately see, oh, okay, this is what I bought, this is great. On the right hand side here, I have an example of molded wood pulp. And molded wood pulp is fairly inexpensive if you buy it directly in China. You can work with packaging designers. We have relationships with a couple of, of packaging designers based out of China who have suppliers who can actually design these wood pulp holders to have your product placed into them. They fit exactly to the product and it really reduces the amount of packaging that you need in the product. So you have your wood pulp holding the product in and then it's packaged in corrugate and that's it. Um, I, I think sometimes people underestimate how important that packaging is experience for an Amazon customer. When you open the package, you want it to be simple and easy to use. The goal is to delight your customer in every possible way, not just by having a great detail page and marketing really well, but when the product arrives, that it matches the experience that the customer expected to have. Okay, so those are the kinds of packaging that I recommend, but how can packaging actually get you suspended, not just your listing, but your account? One of the things that we see quite a lot of is uh, complaints from customers that sellers don't take seriously, either because the seller believes that the customer is lying or is just trying to get a free refund or any number of reasons why it feels like the complaint from the customer is unjust. But the thing to remember is that the complaints from Amazon customers are taken very seriously by Amazon. They will, they will definitely follow up on them. So one of the things that we've seen um, client products suspended for is scratches or smudges on the product because of insufficient packaging. So they were using too thin of a cardboard box. It was getting um, basically bounced around in the box on the way to the customer. It was scratching the product, it was smudging the product, and when it arrived, the customer opened the box, the packaging was kind of dinged up on the side, and the, package, the product itself was scratched and smudged. The initial complaint from Amazon was that customers were complaining that the items weren't authentic, but the actual problem was that it was scratched or smudged. So sometimes the customer complaint doesn't necessarily line up with what the actual issue is. We also have seen issues with perceived inauthenticity due to having no labeling. This is a very common um, practice by new private labelers on Amazon, is to not spend the money for a proper sticker that has a design that has your product name and your net weight and quantity, your country of origin, the information about the manufacturer importer. Um, it can seem like, oh gosh, now I've got to pay for a sticker too, and then how am I going to do that? It's very important to make sure that your product is labeled to the minimum standard that's acceptable in the US for retail consumer goods. Um, if the product arrives crushed or damaged, Amazon will also enforce on that. And uh, listings can be taken down. If there's enough examples, then we've seen customer uh, accounts shut down. And then items that are otherwise damaged in transit that cause the customer to complain that you're selling a used item sold as new. So if your condition listing is new, but it, when it arrives, it's banged up because of the packaging, then it looks used, they'll complain. Okay. so. Here's my shout out to a fellow labs product, Feedback Genius. Uh, we have helped customers to implement various strategies for using Feedback Genius to get information from their customers. The information from your customers, especially the ones who complain, is so valuable. It's the best way to know the kind of product problems that you could have and then prevent them up front. Uh, being able to ask seller, ask questions for your product as a seller asking questions like, well, why was it not as described? What did it, what did it not have that you were expecting it to have? Or can you send me a picture of the packaging that was damaged? And then you can take that back to your supplier and say, hey, I thought you were doing this, or why aren't you using a better um, corrugate for this? Why is this happening? Getting that customer information and then putting the pressure on your supplier is the best way to use the customer feedback approach on Amazon. You have product reviews, you have direct emails from your buyers, and then you have your seller reviews as well. So you get a lot of really great information by selling on Amazon. Okay, so while customer information can be extremely useful, um, it can also be a complete waste of time. Um, so in the first instance, we got a complaint about a product where they said that the product was arriving crumpled and damaged. And from having worked with this seller, we knew that their product was being packaged in food-safe packaging. It was fairly thick. Um, 
it was a fairly thick kind of, of silvery vinyl wrapping, and we knew it would withstand the rigors of travel. But what we hadn't counted on was just how exactly difficult it is to make it through an Amazon fulfillment center, and it got excessively crumbled, and so that needed to be fixed and the packaging upgraded. In another case, however, um, the customer claimed that the item was not as described, and we asked her why, and she said Amazon doesn't give many options. So that was obviously not a terribly helpful situation because um, the listing was actually suspended uh, in large part because of her feedback, and then we got her feedback in detail, and it was because Amazon doesn't give enough options. So that was that was pretty disappointing. Uh, the good news, it made it pretty easy to get the listing reinstated. So in any case, customer information can be very useful. It can also be not so useful, but you definitely need to ask. All right, so how can packaging then increase sales if you're trying to grow your private label brand on Amazon? First, there's a lot of kind of packaging that customers hate. This is why I recommend using frustration-free packaging instead. This is the packaging that Amazon prefers to use for um, nearly everything that's sold by Amazon.com. They're constantly asking vendors to switch to FFP. And all Amazon private label is fulfillment um, FFP, frustration-free packaging. It's a requirement for any new private label item that Amazon makes that it be FFP. So if you're a seller, the way that you go about um, getting approved for frustration-free packaging is to follow these five steps. Design to FFP requirements, submit the items, send the pictures, send the samples, and then you can get the certified sticker. We work with multiple suppliers in Asia and in the U.S. to help get the product designed and then tested for FFP. So this isn't just a product design approach. It also needs to be tested. And the testing consists of basically putting the item in the packaging that it's supposed to go to and then simulating the travel that it will endure. So putting it on a platform and vibrating it like a truck, bouncing it up and down, doing drop tests, essentially mimicking the real life experience of that package. And then at the end of all the testing, you open the box and everything is still safely pristine, new, perfect condition, and it passes. This is definitely the best way to go for selling online because you basically have all recyclable material, so it's easy for the customer. Then you also have materials that are built just for that product, so like the molded um, wood pulp. So everything holds together really well. And you also reduce your overall costs for packaging development because you really only need that recyclable material, that wood pulp, or some other form of recyclable plastic foam um, in a cardboard corrugate box. That's it. It's very simple. It's, it's very um, minimalist. And this is something that Amazon customers have come to expect as well, because this is how Amazon ships out all of its private label, including the Kindles, the Echo. All of it has to be FFP. So customers are expecting this. It's considered a higher-end type of packaging, even though it's actually fairly inexpensive to do everything with corrugate and wood pulp. OK, so here's an example of how FFP can reduce cost. There was one project that we worked on um, for a client, and you can see this, and this is quite an old project. And the goal was to figure out how to get this thing into the fulfillment center and make it to where it wasn't in a non-sortable FC. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the difference in cost when you have an oversized product going to a non-sortable FC versus a sortable FC. So not only do you have a higher cost going to the non-sort, um, the cost of moving it around with uh, the way that a non-sort works versus a sortable. If there's any way to get it into a smaller package, you definitely want to. In this case, the box was half empty. It's just got air on the other side of, of where the kid is supposed to be hugging Elmo. So the Amazon FFP version was actually put into a poly bag and then put into a corrugate box. And so then you have just the, the little creature itself into a poly bag with the correct suffocation warning into a cardboard box, and now it's in a sortable FC. Your FBA costs have been reduced because the shipping and handling is now lower, and your own packaging costs are lower because you didn't have to worry about this fancy packaging. No one sees this package until it arrives at the door, and as an actual Amazon customer, I'm sure that many of you know that the amount of time that you spend with that product packaging is uh, minimal, maybe 30 seconds at the most, unless it has clamshells or ties, in which case, and you just get angry at the package until you can finally get it open and toss the package away. So from 
an e-commerce perspective, there's no need to have fancy, bright colored, pretty looking packaging. No one's going to look at it. What you want is really good FFP packaging to where the customer gets the product they expect in the condition they expect it. And the other thing that's really important about having FFP certification is it makes it much harder for another seller to hijack your listing because getting the product FFP certified is definitely a hurdle to jump. And if you can prove that someone who's hijacking your listing doesn't have FFP by t doing test buys and reporting them to Amazon, that's a really easy way to get them kicked off the listing and warned. Okay, so now let's talk about unsafe or improperly labeled items. This is mostly the compliance piece of this. Um, in the top left, the recall that happened for McDonald's was for cadmium levels. They had um, coloration on the cups that uh, exceeded the allowable limits for cadmium and they all had to be recalled. There's requirements for nutrition labeling for any kind of food. So if you do any private label um, food or importing of food, it needs to be properly labeled for the United States. On the bottom left, you have an exploded lithium ion battery for a cell phone. Uh, lithium ion batteries are quite unstable and need to be produced under careful circumstances and must be certified. Never buy a power bank or lithium ion anything that isn't certified uh, because they explode and light on fire and that's not a good thing. Um, and the bottom here, that 925 is a stamp for sterling silver. So it has to be actual 92.5% uh, sterling to be labeled sterling silver. You have a choking hazard warning for anything that is um, a potential choking hazard, it needs to be labeled as not for children under the age of three. And this is not to say that someone is cognitively able to play with it, it's just that the average three-year-old puts everything in their mouth um, or under three and can choke on small parts. This um, top right is a, a phone after the lithium-ion battery has exploded. Uh, not a pretty sight. Hopefully it didn't light anything else on fire in the meantime. And then the last item here is a product that Walmart imported and it had to be publicly recalled. They were the only importer in the United States. And the reason I think this is very interesting for you guys is because this is similar to what happens with private label. If you're the only brand owner, you're the only one doing it in the United States. This product was supposed to simulate a fever. Um, so the baby would have a fever and you would pretend that you were the doctor and would um, check out their, their lungs and their heart and do the ear check and feed them medicine or whatever. The problem was the way that the fever baby worked is it just got really hot because it had a fever, right? But the mechanism to keep it from getting too hot would break in a lot of these products and then it would burn the child who was trying to care for the fever baby. Uh, so clearly not a successful product. Uh, Walmart was on the hook for the entire recall because they were the only importer of this product in the U.S. and it was made by a factory in China. Um, the cost of a recall is extensive. You have the CPSC paying attention to you. You have to fill out forms and send back the results every month. It's a very involved, very painful process, and you have to try to get back the product from customers or get some sort of certificate of destruction. You just don't want to do it. Um, the cost of one recall can put a small company out of business. It's just absolutely not worth it. Okay, so there are two ways that can get you in trouble if something is unsafe. Um, the first is if there's some sort of regulatory concern. So specifically, if you have um, a product that has lead limits or cadmium limits um, and they're unsafe. In some products, you can actually exceed the allowable level for lead or cadmium just through contamination. If someone had uh, made a glass product in a kiln before your product and it had too much lead in it, just by having the kiln contaminated by the lead could actually contaminate your product too. So it's very important to know what the factory is doing and what other kind of products they make and what countries they make it for, if they really understand what the requirements are in the U.S. and especially in Europe. Um, unsafe electrical wiring, we talked about the problem with lithium-ion batteries. And then, of course, anything that can harm a child is going to get you in pretty significant trouble. From a litigation perspective, um, the top two areas where you can get in trouble with litigation are California Prop 65. Uh, Prop 65 if you just look it up online, all the toxic chemicals that are, that are um, regulated, it's about a nine-page single-spaced list. To actually maintain records on all these is virtually impossible. But there are a few items that have been litigated against where um, a few types of, of toxic items that have been litigated against where you know what the level is. One example of that is luggage um, type items, bags, have an allowable limit of 200 parts per million lead. 
So if you're importing luggage and it's sold in the state of California, which of course it is if you sell on Amazon, you can't limit that if you're FBA, and your product fails for lead, they can come after you and sue you because you're the brand owner. They'll also sue Amazon, but Amazon, you indemnify Amazon in terms of service, and so they'll just make the um, litigator go after you instead. And the other area where I have seen um, significant amounts of litigation is in mislabeled dietary supplements. Dietary supplements that either are just unsafe by their very nature and shouldn't really be sold by anyone because they can cause major problems, but also products that just have regulated pharmaceuticals in them and don't have that on the label. This happens so often with male enhancement drugs, with um, weight loss drugs as well. And they're just something that I would recommend never getting into um, unless you really are willing to go along that kind of really unsafe, illegal path. There are multiple items that got taken down um, when I was working in the compliance department for containing pharmaceuticals that were not on the label, the kind of pharmaceuticals that if you took the wrong amount of the product, you could have a heart attack and die from taking these male enhancement drugs. So supplements, I just recommend just stay away from them. They're not regulated by the FDA, so a lot of times the producers of them are not, um, they're, they're not really doing things the right way because the FDA doesn't regulate it. Um, so in any case, from a litigation perspective, there's a lot of, of potential personal injury litigation pers uh, potential there. All right, so labeling is definitely an issue for private label. Um, we have some examples here. I'm not going to go into detail, but do make sure that you have the correct labeling for your product. It's most important for fine jewelry because you'll just get shut down and you'll never be allowed to sell it again if you label something improperly, but the other areas where labeling can get you into trouble is when customers complain, where they think that they got something that they didn't expect and they return it as item not described or give you bad feed feedback as not as described. That will get you in trouble with the product quality team. Okay, so let's talk about a brand reputation. One of the things that I hear a lot about is finding the exact perfect products for private label on Amazon, and everyone's very careful about what product they tell you about and they're like, oh, my product did so well, or I can't tell you about my product. My product is super special. And if you're just going with a particular product and trying to sell money and get enough sales going to where you can quit your job, great, that's fine. But when you're actually trying to have this be a sustainable thing that you can do more than a year or two at a time, you need to think about what your goals are as a brand. If you're trying to have a brand where you can diversify into a long line of products, get people to go to your own website instead of having so much uh, dependency on Amazon and hopefully eventually into offline channels, you need to make sure that your products are not unsafe. You don't want to start with unsafe products. You don't want to start with potentially um, regulatory misses. You want to think about what your goal is for that brand. If you get hit with litigation or with some sort of fine or recall, that will obviously make things a lot more difficult to grow your product, to grow your independence. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but the most important piece here is that this seller had purchased from a Chinese manufacturer. We're going to talk about intellectual property now. Um, they purchased a product from a Chinese manufacturer who said that it wasn't copywritten. And it turns out that the design of the fabric was copywritten. And the designer of the fabric sued Amazon and the seller. The seller indemnified Amazon in their terms of service, so Amazon seized all of their money and made the um, plaintiff go after the seller instead. So this seller can't get their account back. They can't get their product back. Amazon has kept all of their money, and they're in the middle of a lawsuit because of intellectual property infringement. So this is kind of the worst case scenario here. This seller was trying to do the right thing by going to a Chinese manufacturer and saying, hey, I don't want something that's copywritten. I can't tell you how many times I have worked with people in China in all different areas, from factories to trading companies to laboratories, just across the board, they just don't seem to have the same approach to intellectual property that the U.S. does. I have gotten copies of um, paperwork that I shouldn't have. We had an entire uh, list of protocols that we probably shouldn't have had from other various retailers because the importers from China would just send it to us, even though it would say on the bottom, don't share, and <laughs> they would still share it. So you have to start from that perspective that it's much more likely that they're sharing somebody else's information than it is that they're not. So you have to start from that assumption. If they say, hey, I've got some leftover fabric, 
unless it's black or white <laughs> or green or some other sort of really not possible to um, copyright the design, then you really shouldn't accept that at face value. Okay, so here are the quick and dirty tips for doing IP research. Um, and we're going to start with what kinds of evaluations you need when you're launching your own label. The first one is that every product can have some sort of potential patent or trademark um, or copyright information on it, nearly everything. Fabric designs, if it's a particular design, can have a copyright. I've seen vests with multiple patents on them um, for see-through pockets, I mean, little things that they can patent and try to protect their investment. The second one is that you need to have a brand name that's unique and not already trademarked, and then you need to then trademark your brand and your logo. So one example is that the Amazon swoosh as part of your logo would be violating Amazon's IP. Putting together a logo with a circle and a dot would be violating Target's IP, for example. So the kind of quick and dirty way that I suggest looking up whether or not there's um, public IP that you can use so just so you know, if there's a patent, usually those expire after 10 years. So there's a lot of products that you actually can copy somebody else's work that used to be patented but now is in the public domain. As an example of that, when I look up the Bluetooth beanie, I get 20 pages of results and a ton of competitors, a whole bunch of different designs. So in this case, I feel perfectly confident with this particular product type. This Bluetooth beanie seems like something where there's public um, IP. I won't have any problem privately labeling this product. Now, the problem, of course, is that now you're competing with a whole bunch of different people. You need to come up with other things to differentiate your product, like bundling or a really, really cool design or some sort of licensing for you know, a Tweety Beanie, for example. OK. The other side of things is this cat perch. And there's only two items um, for this cat perch. By the way, on Alibaba, there's about 10 pages of exactly this cat perch offered by a different trading companies and factories. There's only two offerings on the website. One of them is sold by Amazon.com. One of them is a seller listing that claims to be the original one that says that they have a patent on the suction cup design. If there are only two, one sold by Amazon, one sold by the seller, do not touch that product. That means that that seller is very good at protecting their IP and they probably do have a patent that they're very confident they can uh, manage with Amazon because they have no competition on the website. They're carefully protecting their IP. So what is the Amazon Basics methodology? Amazon Basics is one of the Amazon private label brands. And if you type in Amazon Basics into the website, you'll see a broad variety of products. And the basic process is to do kind of, um, let's find a product that sells well, that's got good ratings, and then copy it. So on the left side, you have banana plugs in red and black, and on the right side, you have banana plugs in red and black. black. One of them is the Monoprice high quality brass speaker banana plugs. One of them is the Amazon Basics connector banana plugs. They're exactly the same item. One of them was launched in October 2012, did exceptionally well, and one of them was launched in February 2013. The one that was launched in 2012 was the Monoprice, which is on the right. The one that was launched in 2013 was Amazon Basics on the left. Now there are two really important things for you to note here. The first is that the Amazon Basics plugs are slightly cheaper, but they look exactly the same and they probably function exactly the same. The other thing that's also really important to note is that the Amazon Basics picture is much better. The marketing is much better. And when you're trying to compete on this sort of model, the Amazon Basics model, let's copy it and do it better and cheaper, you have to have a better detail page and you have to have a slightly lower cost. Otherwise, it won't work. So this is the overall Amazon Basics methodology. We'll talk about other methodologies in just a bit, but this is a methodology that works quite well. And for those of you who are already selling at retail arbitrage, you already have a ton of data on what sells well, what sells quickly, what are the high moving products. You can look at this in sales rank as well, but you already know what sells quickly. Take a look at that, see what you can start with if you want to take this particular tactic. All right, so the quick tips for sourcing evaluation. Um, the most important one that I want to say out loud is don't ever buy anything that says as seen on TV. It's a really bad idea. Um, Alibaba in general is full of a bunch of crap. The most important thing to know about the way that Alibaba works is that there's very few actual factories in Alibaba. There's a ton of manufacturers representatives or trading companies. And what they do is they work with the factories directly and then you're giving them a portion of the sale. 
So they give you those cost sheets with their margin built in. So there's always a little bit extra that you're paying that trading company to be able to purchase from them in Alibaba. When you're looking overall at sourcing, the most important thing to do is to have defined your brand image before you start sourcing. There are many types of factories in the world. There are many types of work that you can get out of those factories, but you need to know what you want in the first place. If your goal is low cost, then great, go to a factory that will focus on price. But if your goal is high-end consistent quality, then you need to double check that factory can actually make that happen. Don't just trust the cost because sometimes they'll give you low cost but can't actually produce to the product that you actually want them to produce. All right, so how do you protect your brand? Number one, uh, for everyone who's listening, Amazon will not protect your brand for you. Amazon does not have that position when it comes to bringing new selection onto the website. The position, as you know, is to make things simple for sellers to onboard and simple for listings to onboard simple for sellers to list against existing ASINs. Brand registry does not protect you from other people listing on your ASIN. All it does is make it to where you control the data. Then you have to go through this process of doing test buys and reporting competitors. So the best way to approach this is to make sure your product is different in some way. Don't just generic things. Put a new UPC on it and then slap your stick on it and sell it. That's hijacking somebody else's IP and it's not cool. You want to actually do your own product with something that is different for you. One of the products that we did for Amazon Basics, we copied uh, a brand name product, but we changed the size of the item slightly and then changed the color. And so then it was a different product, essentially. You need to make at least that level of change to make sure that you can protect your brand from the copycats. Then you do test buys. You list out what the situation is. If you have FFP, that makes it really easy because if it doesn't show up in an FFP box, clearly not what's on the listing. The goal here is to prove that the customer experience is bad when the customers buy from those other sellers on your listing because Amazon does not really care that much about you, the seller. They care about the customers who are buying it. Make sure that it's clear that the other sellers are listing against your item and it's not as you have described it, so they're not getting the item that the customer expected to get. And then it's fairly simple to get Amazon to take action against those sellers. Okay, so when we talk about customs, um, customs is just the enforcement agency that handles all of the um, products that come through. They enforce for over 40 different agencies, one of which is the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, they also enforce for Fish and Wildlife. If you ever tried to import something with Mother of Pearl or any sort of other animal product and got something stuck, then you know that Customs enforces for Fish and Wildlife. They also enforce for the FDA and the USDA. This is an example of the kind of things that are stopped by the CPSC. So for non-children's products, the number one item stopped by the CPSC is holiday lights, um, next hair dryers, lighters, and luminaries. The top three of four of those are electrical products. If you're bringing in anything electrical from China, you must make sure that it's listed with a nationally recognized testing laboratory. It should have some sort of listing like UL, Intertech, SGS, TUV. They have marks. You can look them up online or call them and verify the mark, but you need to make sure that you're buying something that's safety listed. It's a pretty basic thing for a factory to do. If your factory doesn't have safety listing, then they're very um, poor factory to source from and you want to move on to another guy. For children's products, uh, the number one way to get your product seized is lead paint or lead content. And this is because the Customs and Border Patrol folks, the CPSC agents who sit with them, have HDXRF guns. They're handheld devices that can scan a product and within 30 seconds tell you the chemical composition of the product. It's very simple to find lead. You just point and shoot. 30 seconds later, it says 2% lead. Okay, great. That item gets seized and tossed. Um, small parts is pretty easy to test for as well because you just need to drop it from a height of three feet. And if it's not labeled as not being for small children, the choking hazard warning from before, then they can seize it for small parts if a piece breaks off. Um, phthalates is a kind of plasticizer that causes um, excess. It's a, basically an estrogen um, copy and it disrupts the endocrine system so it's it's banned for any products for children because it can damage their growing bodies and they don't grow properly if they have these items in their body and those items can easily be banned. The next one I think is really important for you guys to know is tracking labels. 
your item, if it doesn't have a proper tracking label on the products, not just on the packaging, but on the products itself in a durable location, not just a sticker, usually for these types of items it needs to be printed on or a permanent part of the product, you have to have a label that traces back to the exact lot and factory where the product was made. Otherwise, it will not be allowed for sale in the U.S. But I think that's something that's really important for everyone to know, that even things like tracking labels get your product seized and um, set aside by the U.S. CPSC. So follow the rules, especially if you're doing children's products. Those are the, the most likely to be enforced upon. Uh, and the second most likely are electrical products. All right, so um, in kind of tying this up, you need to know what your brand strategy should be. Um, a lot of people focus on marketing, but we want to talk about what should your brand strategy be in terms of the kind of products that you develop. Are you stick label or aspirational? This is kind of the good, better, best idea. Stick label is a good product, aspirational is a better product, and you just don't do best on Amazon. It doesn't really work with private label. Stick label is like Amazon Basics. You take it, you copy it, you put your name on it. Um, you make it different in some way, maybe different packaging, but it's basically just sticking your label on it. Aspirational is when you take a product and you make it better in some way, some sort of design element. So as an example, this peel and stick label for t-shirts, somebody else made it, you put a label on it, and now it's yours. So when you focus on stick label, you should be focused on price, simple packaging, uh, a clear cost-based value proposition, and you don't want to have products more than about $100 if you're really competing on price on the website. People just don't buy that much stuff that's high-end online. For aspirational products, you want to focus on four plus stars. Whereas a stick label product, you want to make sure it's at least three stars. When you're competing on cost, the quality isn't as, as much importance to a customer's mind, but when you're competing on quality, it really is that important to have those star ratings. You want to make sure that your pricing is appropriate to the competition, not significantly lower. The packaging needs to be appropriate to the quality of the product as well. You don't want a super nice product that comes in really terrible packaging. If you're trying to do something that's aspirational, like 100% organic Egyptian cotton, you want to have that on the detail page. Make it really about the really great quality and the safety of this 100% organic cotton. The product testing should absolutely include quality testing as well as regulatory and safety. When it's just stick label, just make sure it follows the law, make sure you won't get sued. When it's aspirational, you want to make sure this product quality is good too. That's how you get those high reviews. That's how you get those people who sell by word of mouth essentially, who are like, yeah, I use this product and it's super awesome. It totally solved my problem. You want to test to make sure that works. Don't just trust your Chinese manufacturer. They will tell you whatever you want to hear in most cases just to sell the product. That's what they do. Their goal is to sell product to you. Your goal is to build a brand and get people to like what your product is. So in some ways, even though they're your partner, they're also a bit your adversary, and you need to always keep that in mind. As an example, an aspirational type label is something like an REI private label of a down jacket. $150, but the comparable North Face jacket is $200. Um, for children's products, you have this um, Columbia item that's for $28.80. The uh, private label Kohl's item is $20. And to remember, all children's products are regulated. So because this is boys, you want to make sure that those zippers uh, are compliant with lead limits. All right, so what is quality testing? Depending on the product, you can test the performance of the product in the marketplace before actually getting it into the marketplace. You want to work with an expert who can help you develop that protocol. What should it be for your particular product? And this is something you can ask about uh, later, but quality testing is really about the product. So I don't want to get into too much detail here since it's all very product focused. Incorporate the community content in your product. People give you a ton of great feedback. Improve the product. Um, create a new product that's even better, but use that feedback. It's extremely valuable that Amazon gives so much great feedback, uh, feedback on your competitor products as well. So we're gonna close out with the example of a private label mortar and pestle. So when I talk about the steps to launch a private label product in a compliant way that Amazon will focus on um, as being compliant, there are the four steps. You develop your product, you source your product, you test it, and then you launch it. The steps to develop is the very first thing you want to do for any product that you're looking at is determine if it's legally an issue. 
Now for a mortar and pestle, it's one of the oldest kitchen implements out there. There is no patent on a mortar and pestle. We're good to go. Then you look at comparative customer reviews. Well, one person who bought a mortar and pestle on a different listing said, at first I was hesitant because it didn't come in any packaging, so I couldn't check who the makers were, um, what the material was made of, or any such information. It was just what you see is what you get. It did have a Made in Thailand sticker, but I had no idea if Thailand was famous for its mortars and pestles. And then you have this, which is saying, oh, okay, so if I want to make customers really happy, I should include some sort of packaging information and brand information. And the second part, if the seller wanted to make this product perfect, I'd suggest adding a similar rubber grip base as I added. So in this case, their complaint was that the mortar and pestle would move around on the countertop, and they added a rubber base grip to keep it from moving. These are the kinds of, of pieces of feedback that you get for free in terms of developing your product by going onto Amazon. Use them. Then determine if you're trying to sell an aspirational brand or just stick label. For um, a mortar and pestle, this is more aspirational. Most people uh, who use mortar and pestles are hand making their food or hand breaking up their uh, spices. These are not people who are just going to go buy um, a little jar of spices in the in the store. They're actually going to buy the original spice and, and break it in a mortar and pestle, right? So this is more of an aspirational type product. And then determine if it can be competitive by itself or if you need to bundle it in some way. Once you've decided that, then you need to go find where you can get this product. Find a reputable source. One of the easiest ways is to look at the customer reviews to see where your inspiration product came from, like Thailand. Um, another way is to work with an experienced sourcing agent. So I mentioned that we have Rain on our team, and she is extremely experienced with finding um, factories that are based on the specification of the client. So specifically, if you want an aspirational product, you want to go with a better factory. If you want a stick label product, you may go with a somewhat less good factory to get that cost. You always want to go with at least three factories. Rain says that on average, it takes her looking at least 10 factories to find one good factory. So you want to go with a whole bunch of different factories, ask a lot of questions, get the samples, really look at the samples, evaluate how they work with you and what kind of work they do, then go with a factory. Always try to get ISO 9001 certification. If your product is aspirational, you want the products to be good quality. And then before it ships out to you, you should go with an inspection of the product. Um, if it's your first product, you may not have the money for that. You may want it shipped directly to you, and then you inspect it before sending it to Amazon. If it's going directly from the factory to Amazon, you need to inspect it. And don't go with the cheapo um, $100 type inspectors. Those people don't make enough money in the marketplace, and they're much more susceptible to bribes. And so you end up getting an inspector who's like, yeah, your product's great, and then it shows up all broken because they got paid off by the factory. You want to go with a reputable lab, a reputable third-party agency that has anti-corruption, anti-bribery practices in place, and pays their employees well enough that they aren't tempted to take the red envelope from the factory. Okay, so testing, you need to have a good protocol and it needs to be based on your brand strategy. Labs are the experts on this, but they're in the business of selling you testing and they'll give you a giant long protocol and tell you that it costs $3,000. Probably not required. So work with someone who really understands what your product should be, what your goals are, and then choose the tests based on that. Um, if you only get samples, you can you can send them into the lab and double check. Because I told you that it was passing for CPSIA, it's like 20 bucks to send it into a lab and get it tested for lead. It's absolutely worth the cost. Um, there's usually a $50 um, lab minimum fee to issue a report, but if you have a couple of samples, you can send those in and get them all tested. Then you work with the factory to fix the problems, get the issues done, and then work to create the FFP packaging to then ship your product. And last to launch. Make sure you have good pro good quality photos that meet Amazon policy guidelines, the white background, the 85% um, covering the, the picture. In certain categories, those pictures aren't required to be white background, but you want to still do white background anyway because that's what looks high-end on Amazon. Um, make sure that your detail page is used using about 10th grade level of English, and make sure that your keywords are appropriate to what people will look for, but also be really careful of trigger keywords for anything that is a restricted product. And this is also something that we support our sellers with, is making sure that there aren't any keywords or phrases on their detail page that can get them in trouble with restricted products in terms of illegally made claims. Um, the most common one is claiming that something can cure a disease, but there are many others as well. And then we help with iterating that customer feedback into the next version of the product or the next type of product.
Okay, so in summary, you are liable. Make sure you're testing and labeling properly. Amazon will hold you responsible, so don't expect that you can get out of anything and Amazon will take the heat. They absolutely will not. But make sure you know what's going on with your feedback and customer contacts because they will shut down your listing, they will shut down your account if they feel like it. And customers do have set expectations of product based on price. So make sure that your high-end product is priced appropriately, price it high. If it's a cost-based product, don't price it too high for it to actually compete. Okay, so I know that was a lot of content, so now we have a little bit of time for questions. Holy cow. Um, I can tell you, Rachel, you are getting some amazing feedback um, from the people on the webinar, um, sharing some great knowledge with them. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask that you kind of focus on giving kind of the shortest answer um, so we don't get too long-winded. And we, we might have time for a few more questions besides the ones I've already pulled out. Um, just so everybody on the webinar is aware, we will not answer specific questions related to your product. So a couple of people have asked, like, I have a product that does this. What do I do about that? So we're going to try to keep it general and talk about the process. And if you have specific questions, um, you can, you know, reach out to us at Seller Labs or to Rachel directly um, to get answers to that. So um, there were a couple questions at the beginning that were related to um, FFP. Um, so um, the, the, the one that I thought was really interesting, Lindsay asked, you know, she, she feels that there's been an uptick in complaints. Um, and I guess this was not with FFP. This was with uh, products. Um, she said, um, are there any useful avenues to discuss with Amazon the fact that they are tossing products in a huge shoebox with one piece of brown paper? Um, her products are protected reasonably well, but don't, but not to shake around in huge empty boxes. And because of that, she feels there's been an uptick in complaints and then, um, and then, and then products, product suspensions. Can, can you speak a little to that? Right, so an FFP certification makes it to where um, you can actually have the FFP certification to where no matter what exterior packaging it has, then it will still be able to make it safely to your customer. The expectation that Amazon has is that your product should survive no matter what packaging they put it in. And I think that's really not made clear to a lot of sellers that they can put it in a giant box, they can put it in a tiny box, they can do whatever they want your packaging needs to be strong enough to withstand it regardless. So if you look at the product and you're like, yeah, this is pretty good packaging, it's probably not good enough. Uh, Amazon is extremely hard on packaging. And is Amazon, have you seen an uptick in the number of people who are complaining? Not so much the complaints, because the complaints already existed and they have for a long time, but definitely an uptick in the enforcement. Gotcha. So the uh, the enforcement has, and is that because um, Amazon is taking it more seriously, or because there's, um, they're they're building better bots for it, or a combination of? A combination. So the team that's responsible for this was only launched at the end of 2013, and they really had a lot to do to take down unsafe products first, especially counterfeits. Now they're moving on to the secondary level of um, of focus for them, which is really used items sold as new and items that are not as arrived, not as described. And items not as described is a kind of a general catch-all, and usually that's where the packaging issues come in. So that and the used is sold as new, because if you have not good enough packaging, it arrives not in the condition the customer expected, and it looks used. Okay, there were a couple questions re related to Elmo. Um, so you showed Elmo in the box, and then you took Elmo out of the box, and you put him directly in a poly bag in a, in a box without the packaging for FFP. Um, when you do that, do you ship that Elmo to Amazon in a big corrugated box, or did Amazon put it in the poly bag? And then in addition to that, a question was asked, you know, you, you mentioned that no one cares about packaging, but could somebody see that product as fake because it's not including in the packaging? 
If it's Elmo, then yes, because you guys shouldn't be selling Elmo. <laughs> um, but if it's your own plush, no, no. If it's actually got the FFP certi certified stamp on the outside of the box, that's the thing that's really important. You get to use that um, stamp that Amazon issues to you. And that gives it its own credibility just by, by doing that. And yes, it does have to ship in the corrugate. That's what passes the ISTA 3A transit testing is the corrugate. Gotcha. Um, and so Chris said he really likes the idea of FFP. He was searching on Seller Central for help, and it looks like each product would need to be relisted as FFP friendly. If that occurs, does that mean the listing would be, I guess, quote unquote, new and therefore lose its sales and review and search history? So ideally, it's a variation. Um, that's the way most of these are done on the .com site as well, is that there is a non-FFP and an FFP version. Um, personally, I just prefer to start with FFP. If you have an existing product that has the ability to do variations, then you can just add the variation on the same detail page, and then you get to keep all of your reviews and your sales and so on. If it doesn't have um, variations, then usually seller support can help you to set it up for variations. If they can't, then you would need to start over with FFP. Gotcha. So um, there are a couple questions with regards to choking hazards. Um, is there any specific size that the product needs to be to where it's not including choking? Or do you have to have a choking hazard warning if the item is not intended for children, if it's intended for adults? So the choking hazard warning is for anything where it looks like it should be for children or would be attractive to children where it can't pass the choking hazard test. So if you're thinking of something like a frozen doll um, or um, you know a private label type of doll, if it doesn't pass the drop test, like if the, the way the drop tests work is you have to be at least three feet and then you drop it at various angles. If a piece of the item breaks off that's small enough that fits within the small part cylinder, it's about um, an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half wide. It basically simulates the width of a child's throat. If it's too big, they won't be able to swallow. If it fits within that cylinder, then they'll be able to swallow, but maybe not swallow all the way down. So really what it, what it is for, that warning, is for items that are either for children or attractive to children, but shouldn't be around babies and toddlers. Gotcha. I think that's... Uh... I guess if, 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 if all else fails, get the, get the hazard. Um, sort of. It can look really weird sometimes. We used to see things like people labeling um, knife sets with sharp points hazard. We're like, yes, it's a knife set. <laughs> it's got a sharp point. Well, so sometimes it, it can be a little bit overkill. We know Amazon has, or um, McDonald's has to tell you that coffee is hot, right? So we all know what kind of world we live in. Yep, all the litigation. <laughs> yes. So one of the questions came up when you were talking about electric testing. Um, you had mentioned a company you had um, for electric testing benchmarks. Can you repeat that? So to be listed, um, OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and, and um, Health Administration for essentially workers in the U.S., they certify laboratories. And those are then called nationally recognized testing laboratories, or NRTLs. So it's a government agency that sets the rules, and then they accredit testing laboratories to do the work. So all products that can be used in a workplace in the United States need to be listed for safety. It's an OSHA requirement. Um, and if it, if it can be reasonably only used in a home, then you have kind of a loophole, but that's the reason why nearly everything is safety listed in the U.S. is because it's required for all workplaces. And that could be a daycare. It could be a small office. So nearly everything needs to be listed. The companies that are um, NRTLs in the U.S. are UL, Underwriters Laboratories, Intertech Testing Services, um, TUV, which is a German company, um, and uh, SGS just recently got approved for their electrical testing program. Uh, you can actually find this on Wikipedia if you look up NRTL, or Nationally Recognized Testing Laboratory. But it's really, really, really important, and I can't emphasize this enough, to make sure that you only source electrical products that are listed. 
great. Um, Rachel, some people have asked if you could go back to the slide where you kind of describe your team. Um, so if you could flip back to that. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour. We've been going for an hour. I typically don't like my webinars to go past an hour, but I, I believe that the information we're providing is extremely valuable, and I would like to kind of push on a little bit further. I understand that some people might have to drop off the webinar because it's it's been past an hour, but I think that um, answering a few more questions might be useful. Um, we will also provide you information to be able to contact um, Rachel and her team directly as well as you can always contact the customer service team at Seller Labs who will um, provide who will provide you um, information. Um, we will also be providing you a copy of the slides as well as a copy of this presentation. So fear not if you didn't write all of your notes down and we would be happy to share, um, share with you. So a, a couple more questions and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, I actually didn't know the answer to this, but so I was interested myself. How does Vendor Express play into this? Um, if you sell something to Vendor Express that violates IP and Amazon gets sued, does that trickle back to you as a wholesaler to Vendor Express? Yes. If you're the brand owner and you sign the paperwork, then you're indemnifying Amazon for um, a whole host of legal issues. Um, and the other thing that's kind of annoying is that you then have to only settle things through arbitration. It's just, you basically sign your life away in those terms of service. The, where, the area where Vendor Express is useful is in getting marketing content. So right now, and I don't know if this is still going, it was a couple weeks ago, you get five free A plus detail pages when you go through with Vendor Express. So you, if you only have a couple items, then that's great. Then you won't go up to the five items. If you have more than that, then choose your top sellers. An A-plus detail page allows you to add a whole lot of content in the product description that you can't do as a seller. So as a seller, you obviously can't embed videos or do a lot of HTML or, or images in the um, product description, only in the image files. In an A-plus detail page, you can do video demonstrations. You can do large pictures with demo pieces. You can do comparative images. Um, so it's really worthwhile to, to use Vendor Express just for the purpose of marketing. Um, this actually just came in. I thought this was a really good question. Um, when when selecting a factory for the first time, what what would be like a checklist of of things to kind of have handy? So there's kind of the general checklist, and then there's your product based checklist. So from a general perspective, you want to ask them for any certifications they have. Um, this could be ISO 9001 certifications, it could be an ICTI CARES certification for social audits, it could be um, their CTPAT or GSV for security compliance. Um, whatever they have, ask for it. Uh, and then double check that there aren't weird um, Photoshop type indications on the certification because there's plenty of those kind of false ones that get passed out as well. Uh, I would also ask what their capabilities are. Um, who their current customers are. There's some of them that are really familiar with selling to EU. Great, then use them for your European business. There's some people that have only ever sold to US customers and don't understand how different Europe is compared to the US. Uh, you want to work with factories who can actually provide the compliance that you need to sell a product. Europe is much, um, there, there's just a lot more funding for enforcement in Europe. So you really need to be more careful there. I would also ask um, what their primary competency is. So a lot of times factories will just try to sell you stuff. So they're actually a factory that primarily does shoes, but you say, hey, I really want to do this bag. And they're like, of course we can do a bag. We can do a bag all day long, even though all they really do is shoes. And so then you get a bag that maybe isn't that great because the factory workers who are doing it aren't experienced with doing bags. So the, the top three things I would look for is what their certifications are, um, who their primary customers are and where, what countries, and then what's their current core competency. Do they actually know how to do the thing that you want them to do, or is their core competency something else and they're just trying to expand into new business? Awesome. Let's go here with about two more questions. Um, 
So I'm, one of the questions that was asked was how to go beyond manufacturer's assurances to prove that the products you are buying isn't a clone of something that has already been patented or legally protected. So to be absolutely certain, you need to hire a lawyer. Um, Amazon has a legal team just for this purpose. The problem is to do it properly, it costs anywhere from three to five thousand um, dollars. Lawyers aren't cheap, <laughs> so to be absolutely certain is quite expensive. Unless you have a brand to protect that's fairly large, then it's just there's not enough money for that. What the simplest thing to do is uh, to protect yourself from these kind of cloning issues is to just not clone products. Ask for a product and then modify it in some way. Move the handle to the side. Um, change the design slightly. Instead of Velcro, you snap. There's a whole bunch of different things that you can do to modify the product slightly to where it, it will be a different product, enough different that you could defend yourself if someone claims that you copied their stuff. Um, I, I, I have our final question, but I want to ask one question before we get to that. Um, it's been asked by a couple of people. Is it possible to import directly from China to an Amazon FBA warehouse? Yes, absolutely. That's actually how Amazon does it. The thing that you want to make sure of is that the factory understands how to ship to Amazon. Everything needs to be packaged properly and labeled properly and you need to tell them up front which FCs the items need to go to. So for you that just means effort being put into creating that shipping plan then sending over the information to your factory so they can sticker properly. Then you definitely want to make sure there's an inspection from inspectors who know Amazon requirements. So we work with um, a testing lab that is used by Amazon that's familiar with Amazon requirements that's got a pretty good uh, mandate rate as well and we only use them in China and then we use Amazon's freight forwarding uh, company and we use Amazon's former broker Amazon no longer uses this broker because it got too big but Amazon's former broker specializes in FBA sellers so the the main pieces that you need in place to import directly from China to an Amazon fulfillment center are to have an inspection service that can go in and double check that everything is actually appropriately packaged and labeled so that it can be received without any issues. The second thing you need is a freight forwarder who understands how to um, ship and to make sure that the um, items can clear properly so they'll ask for the correct documents from the factory. And then you need to get a broker who can handle the US customs filing for you. Um, the product compliance piece is different than the HTS classification piece and customs filing paperwork. Those are two different parts of compliance. Classifying for customs is different than classifying for testing. There's different needs there. There's different paperwork needs there. You want to work with a qualified broker. Great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to end on this question. I think it's a really good one. What are the three most common issues you have to deal with in regards to private label sellers while at Amazon? So I was in product compliance. So the number one issue that I had to deal with with private label sellers was um, people selling knockoff or counterfeit electronic items that would light on fire and injure customers. So that was the number one issue that we had to deal with in compliance and it was constant. Um, the, I don't think people realize how dangerous these things are. If you look at the internal componentry, there's the need for insulation, there's the need for proper wiring, there's the need for making sure that you have um, fail safes if things overheat and factories that aren't using listed products or that are just selling cheap stuff they're selling really dangerous products so that was the number one thing was how dangerous these electrical products can be uh, the number two um, issue was anything for children so anytime something was engineered in such a way that a child could be injured or um, even if a child could potentially be injured by the product then that got reviewed and investigated. Um, so one example of this, uh, and this is actually a Disney product, which is kind of funny to me because um, Disney should have known better, but this happened with sellers as well. So just using the Disney product to not pick on anybody, um, but the big guys who can handle it, they designed a plastic tricycle with the Cinderella castle in the front. So you can imagine pointy spires 
on a moving object. And so kids were like impaling themselves on this and getting pretty injured. So things like that, you want to be really careful when you're doing um, children's products because children are not adults. They can't think two or three steps ahead. They don't realize, oh, if I'm going fast, I probably shouldn't lean over the top of this pointy thing. Uh, and then they just get injured. Um, and then the last thing that we saw a ton of were requests from the legal team to take down ASINs that violated someone's IP. <laughs> so those are really the top three things that I saw in compliance were um, electrical safety, children's product safety, and uh, IP infringement. Lots of IP infringement. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I again, I thank you for your time, and I thank everybody for joining us today on the webinar. I know we covered a lot of information. We will have a recording posted in probably a day or so, as well as we'll make all of the slides available to you. Um, thank you, Rachel, for your time and for sharing all of this great knowledge with us. Um, at Seller Labs, we really like to provide education and knowledge to our customers and you've really helped us uh, hit that mark um, today and we appreciate that. Um, I know there were a lot of questions that were asked both on the chat and on the email before that have not been answered and again we will work with Rachel to try to address some of these in blog posts on our website so please look for that. Thank you everybody for coming today and we appreciate it and uh, we look forward to continuing to serve you at Seller Labs. Have a great day.